right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Glitchy Pancakes. Real talk about the world of fandom. I'm Jesse. And I'm Rob. Today, we're talking about racism and bias in the publishing world. It is a problem. It's always been a problem. It continues to be a problem. And to discuss this with us and other things, because they have some really exciting works out right now that we want to plug for them. Uh, We have two fantastic guests. Uh, First of all, let's introduce, she is an advocate for equality and inclusion in publishing, creator of the hashtags, what WOC writers here and also publishing paid me. We got to talk about that one. And an author whose works include the Nightmareverse books, starting with the Blade So Black trilogy, and an upcoming graphic novel for DC featuring Nubia, Wonder Woman's twin sister. I am pumped about that one. Oh, Writing under the name L.L. McKinney, please welcome L. McKinney, Rob. Uh, welcome, L. McKinney. <laughs> welcome, L. <Elle. laughs> thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yes, yes. Thank you for giving us your time. <laughs> also with us, we have a philosopher, theologian, poet, science fiction and fantasy author whose works include the epic fantasy saga, The Three Gifts, available wherever you get your books, as well as several short stories and poetry collections. His most recent poetry collection is called Nappy Metaphysic. Please oh, welcome yeah. Gerald L. Coleman. What's up, Gerald? Hey, what's happening? Welcome, How you doing? Gerald. <laughs> Oh, it's good. Good to be here. Thank you guys for having me on the on the uh, podcast. Nice, Absolutely. Nice. Yeah, we really appreciate y'all being here and, and giving us your where, time where to talk pan- about this. Where are the pancakes? <laughs> they are, they are, they are in the mail. Uh, we ha- right. they, they may be a little bit stale in by the time the they reach mail. you, but they are uh, on the way. Okay. <laughs> it's, ru- okay. it's real I, maple I, syrup. I thought, I, okay. I thought there were pancakes involved somewhere. That's really the only reason I agreed to do this. <laughs> there will be. I, I don't. I can't vouch for the quality of them yet. That's something we're still working on because of shipping and everything. They may okay. be a little dried out, but you just dredge them in syrup. They'll be got all right. It, got, but, it, yeah. got it. Got it. Got <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, no. We we really appreciate y'all being on though. Like we, we know it's you know taking the time to talk about uh, to talk about topics like this. I know you got to be tired of talking about it. Y'all are right. both fantastic on social media about like addressing a lot of these issues, and um, it it must get absolutely exhausting. But we uh, we appreciate you you know, taking the time to continue to talk about it and continue to help people understand how stuff works. Absolutely. How are y'all holding up in general? Elle, how are things, uh, how are things in your neck of the woods? Um, well, I'm in Kansas city, so I'm in the Midwest. Um, it's okay. not as wild as, you know, it was on the coasts and now it's starting to be down South. Um, but I guess Kansas city was on some projected list for, you know, the end times. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> We're all still careful. At least my family is super careful. Uh, people that I know, like my apartment building, there are signs that people are being super careful. But since everything's opened back up, folks is just out here wilding. So, uh, <laughs> God, yeah. it's unfortunate. And- yeah, and the the other three of us are here in Georgia. Gerald's up here in, in Atlanta with me, and so we've we've been seeing how it's going. And we, do, we we I don't know if we have enough time on a single podcast to say what we think about how people in Georgia are handling this. Man, right. and, <sighs> and I'm a nurse, so oh yeah, in a small podunk town, looking at people just enjoy themselves like uh, it's it's a celebration. When I know the truth, like we're seeing the hospitals just fill up like past dispensers, and it's not cool. Yeah. Oh no, it's it's bad. But yeah. that's 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 not the terrible thing that we're here to talk about. What? <laughs> we're talking about another terrible thing. <laughs> and that's out of, terrible things. Despair, right. That was just out of, one of, out of all things. the many dumpster fires currently right. burning across the United States, that's not the one we're focusing on today. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> I wanted to I actually wanted like a kind of as an entry point into this to bring up um L, you'd started recently a few weeks back a hashtag on Twitter, publishing paid me. And that took off in a pretty big way. Huge. I, if you could, um, would you like just let people know what your purpose was in creating that hashtag and um, what it revealed when it started to take off? Yeah. So um, this conversation about, you know, uh, what black authors are being paid versus what non-black authors are being paid um, is one that we black authors have been having for decades um, right. As long as, you know, it was made legal for black people to be able to read and write. And we've been having right. the conversation for that long. Right. Um, but it, it, it never progressed outside of us and our immediate circles of, you know, friends and allies because no one else wanted to be part of it. Um, so it's, it's a thing that we knew that there was a disparity. Like it's, it's not, it wasn't a secret. 
So one day, uh, the homie Tochi Onyabuchi, he tweeted that, hey, white people, uh, white authors in particular, if you want to do this equality thing, we're going to have to have the uncomfortable conversation of how much you make. Um, right. And I'm paraphrasing. But that's about along the lines of what he said. And he had all these people responded to him, you know, being like, yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about it. Motorcycles outside my window. Um, let's talk <laughs> about it. Let's let's get into it. I'm down. But nobody was putting up numbers. Right. And days go, And I'm just frustrated with watching, you know, his tweet climb. But nobody has any meaningful interaction with it. And hmm. so I just like, y'all said y'all were going to do it. So put up or shut up. So for about 15, 20 minutes, I'm, you know, needling it, folk. Y'all said it's Black Lives Matter right now. Such as such. It shouldn't take us dying and dead in the streets, but here we are. What you going to do? Right. Like? And right. nobody's saying anything. So I was like, do y'all need a hashtag or something? Here you go. Publishing pay me. That's literally hmm. how this was quote unquote. Quote. <laughs> there was no predetermined, like there was no... We didn't come up with like a campaign or anything. It just happened. Right. But I tell you, you stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Once it did take off, that's where we were like, all right, so let's do this. Uh, he started having people crunch numbers. There's going to be some initiatives coming out with that, you know, to take to the publishing houses aside from, you know, just here's a thread on Twitter that you kind of have to dig through. Mm -hmm. Um so that people can use it. And I know for a fact that certain black authors, um, since it happened, who have been in negotiations, were able to utilize what was learned on the tag in order to nice. better facilitate something for themselves. So it's already nice. having an effect. Um, yeah. Can, can we, uh, are we able to, to talk some of those numbers a little bit? I mean, I know we don't have, don't have like all the numbers in front of us, but like, what did, what did people see? Cause there were people that were like shocked and feeling sick once people actually started throwing numbers up there. It we was upsetting. Mad. We were mad. Cause it's, it's like, and I use this um, example on another um, talk that I was on earlier. It was like, if somebody had to tell you, well, how much bigger is a state than a city? And you're like, oh, well, Massachusetts is a state that's clearly bigger than a city. But then you find out Texas is out here running around. So wow. it's going from expecting wow. Massachusetts to, oh yeah, but also Texas. You know what I'm saying? The size of a country, uh, several countries, as a matter of fact. So we knew that the disparity was there and we knew that it was a big disparity. We didn't know we were talking like somebody Massive. who's brand new, brand new to the game getting $800,000 for their debut book. Debut. Never wrote a book in their life. Totally unproven. Versus N.K. Jemison, the god. Oh, yeah. The god. The god. The god. Because this woman has won awards and has done this thing back to back three times. She's not the first black author. She's not the first black right. woman author. She's the first period. Okay? Right. right. And people right. can say... The, you know, there's a difference between commercial fiction versus science fiction, blah, blah, blah. True. To right. a degree. Mm -hmm. However, you have somebody who is that versus somebody who is nothing. Not them as a person, but right. their track record for writing. Nothing. Correct. And NK doesn't break 100000 for her advancement. That's books. nuts. Yeah. Stuff like she that. Or Jessamine Ward. Who, like, you got Obama shouting out your books, ma'am. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And how she had her agent after this book won these awards, after these famous people are reading it, after it does what it does and hits, you know, does these, she's New York Times, blah, 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 has to fight to get less than 200K. Like, her agent had to <sighs> dogfight for this. You know, wow. and, and so these weird. are these are the type of numbers that we're seeing. Um, and it just and then we're seeing these intersections where you have and this is a, in YA. So I know this. you have these white guys who are writing black characters, making five times more than the black women who are writing the same. Characters. That's, yeah, Crazy. that's another thing. That, and I think you had commented on that a few times on, on Twitter about how like that's that's a particular I mean, it seems like really a slap in the face. It's like you're going to you're going to pay. You can have two people writing the same story, 
mm-hmm. a, with, with a black protagonist and you're going to pay mm-hmm. the white guy who writes it five times as much. Like that's, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm glad you created that hashtag because it seemed right. like it just, it shines some light into some dirty, dirty corners <laughs> that people weren't yeah. looking at before. And it seems, I mean, you said that it is, it's enabling people at this point to actually take these numbers w- into negotiations and be able to say, no, you're not, you're not going to screw me. Like, like other people have been getting screwed right. because now we know that we know this is out there. Right. Um, I've, yeah. I've got a was, question. Uh, I'm let sorry. Me, let I, me I, just, I, let me just, if, if I could just real quickly say sure. that it's, it's it, the, the dirty secret is privilege. Right. That, right. That, that's that's the, the the it's the worst kept secret in the country, right? And and yeah. something that I'm I'm always constantly saying is that race is involved in every facet of what goes on in our culture. Right. And mm-hmm. whatever issue you're talking about, if you dig a little beyond the surface eventually race is going to rear its ugly head. Oh, absolutely. Right? Right. So, but 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 we have a but we have a, a broader culture that that walks around thinking that well, you know, you guys shouldn't talk about race and why are you always making it about race and why are you always bringing race up? Well, the, yep. the reason is that that's what's in the in the grimy corner, right? right. That's that's the dirty little secret. When mm-hmm. an unproven, untested uh, white guy can stroll into a publishing uh, company and get almost seven figures for yeah. the same kind of story that people of color and black folk in particular, people of color in general, black people in particular, have to fight and fuss and scrape to get six figures. Right. 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 That's, 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 that's not just about somebody's talent or access. That's about the dirty little secret of, of the culture that also rears its ugly head in publishing. And that's privilege. Right. But Uh, also here's the thing is that, that with, with those six figures, what people have to realize is that they're not paying the six figures to the same unproven black people. These are our greats that you're paying right. these six figures. But the greats. These are the, these are the people who are dominating these genres. Like these are mm-hmm. people whose books are touted as the best. People will teach these books, okay? Right. They should be teaching them now, but I don't know. Folks get hung up on these dead white dudes for some reason. I don't understand. <laughs> I just, I do not. I do not. I could go the rest of my life without reading another Mark Twain book and be happy. Um, same with To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't need it. And <laughs> my babies don't need it. But thank you. Right. Um, but it's it's our greats. Our mm-hmm. people who are doing the damn thing. They're the ones right. who have to fight for six figures. Mm-hmm. Low six figures, if that. Right. right, yeah, which is just, I mean, the Jemison thing is what re- I knew it was going to be very widespread when this started coming out, but I'm, I'm a huge N.K. Jemison fan. Um, it, it, she deserves absolutely every accolade that she gets, and I, uh, I'm i actually starting uh, teaching uh, high school English in the fall, and I plan on teaching her stuff um, because, I, it's like, I mean, yeah, To Kill a Mockingbird, Mark Twain, etc. I didn't enjoy any of that a fraction as much as I enjoyed The Broken Heart, <laughs> and I, right. I, I, I got so much more out of that so i agree 100 percent. it is is and i think gerald's right that there's no there is no rational explanation that actually makes logical sense for that pay disparity it absolutely has to be because right. of just the privilege of of white authors and the the racism that exists in the industry and and everywhere i think as gerald was saying it's because white men are held up as the gold standard for when it comes to the classical canon Oh, right. Why? I don't know. Right. Because I like some people, I was like, when your canon was being developed, a good portion of the population, it was illegal for us to read and write. So Correct. You can't. Your <laughs> canon is flawed from the beginning. It's <laughs> absolutely flawed, fundamentally flawed. All the numbers aren't there. It's, it's not even possible. 
Right. And then you have these, it's mediocrity is what it is. They're mediocre. The stories mm-hmm. are mediocre at best. They're only canon because I don't, y'all have this thing with dead white dudes. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't get it. Because if you well, were to, you know, you were to uh-huh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Al. Well, I was going to say, if you were to put the book in front of the intended audience who had never heard of them, and you was like, read the first five pages of each of these. Nobody's going to walk away with To Kill a Mockingbird as their preference. Right. And yet she's, that is a white woman, but it's still like the pedestal is whiteness. Like, I'm, right. yeah, right. ladies, you're marginalized by being ladies, white women. But whiteness is still much more of a protection than your uh, womanhood is a detriment. At least it, that's how right. y'all view it and that's how y'all act. Um, right. that's a, there's a big deal with that one. Right. It's not. You're right. not going to be protected. They will cast you to the wolves at the very first right. opportunity, but yep. um, but it's the same thing. So, I, I yeah, I, I I was just going to say that um, it it it's framed in the same way. I mean, even just, for example, look at the country. The country is founded by a group of white dudes who set it up for their own benefit, and everybody else has had to fight and scrape to you know, get a piece of those rights for themselves. The same thing has mm-hmm. happened in publishing. You have, you have these white folks who have created this, this uh, system that benefits themselves. They set themselves up as the gatekeepers and the arbiters of what is great and what is, is worthwhile and worthy. And they have systematically worked to make sure that you know, Chad and Kyle get that opportunity, and the rest of us don't. Yeah. Um, and 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 so that's that's where we are. I mean, look, look this is something I I, I kind of uh, went back and looked at again. Uh, Lee and Low Books does a a diversity in publishing report every few yep. years, and the last one they did in 2019, uh, they they broke it down. Uh, just look at the race if you wanted to look it up. 76 this is in the in the the publishing industry overall 76 percent white caucasian five huh. percent black one yeah. percent native american one percent middle eastern six percent latinx latino mexican uh That's that wild. those are the numbers those are the numbers so when you have uh, almost eighty percent of the publishing industry white. Then the people who are making the decisions, who are signing the checks, who are who are the editors, who are the agents, who are the, the folks making the acquisitions, the people who are doing the marketing and the advertising. Uh, when all of those folks are white, right? Then then Chad and Kyle get a leg up. The rest of right. us have to fight and scrape. To, to just get in the door. Um, right. And I'll give you a prime example. Uh, in the last few years, we've been talking about uh, the fact that when when uh, when these um, publishers, big and small, are doing these anthologies, right? And we say, if you don't have a diverse table of contents, just I'm not even going to look at your your little anthology. It just it just doesn't make any sense. But right. then you have this this group of folk who have have even gone so far as to say, well, diversifying the table of contents is automatically going to mean that the product is going to be less. That right. that, that 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 like at it, some it somehow in their mind that including people of color in general, black folk in, in particular, in their table of contents automatically means that the quality is going to be lower. Now think about that mentality. That right. that somehow or other, if if a if a table of contents is all white, that means it's excellent work. But if you right. have to uh, include uh, uh, people of color, all oh, well, then that automatically means that the quality of that anthology is going to suffer. That's just that's just deep seated racism. racism. That's all it mm-hmm. is. Yeah. That there's, yeah, no, that is. there's no excuse for it, right? Right. And, no, and, right. The, and the interesting thing is, is that a lot of these, a lot of these folks are promoting some of the most mediocre writers mm. you will mm. ever read, right? Yep. And overlooking right. some of the most fantastic writers in the game right now. 
And that's right. that's that's just that's just that's crazy. But that's, that's where we are. Yeah, it, it seems to be. And there and another thing that um that I hear a lot from around uh from around publishing is that what the the reaction that, that that happens a lot of times it ends up specifically it seems a lot of this is, is um, mostly directed toward black authors that, that get shut out of projects or, or don't get the support that they need from publishing houses is because of this like fear of lack of a market for it like the the fear right. that, the fear that people aren't going to buy it that it's not going right. to be popular and right. that people don't want it and I, I that's just so like I don't know what kind of bubbles they're living in to think that that's true. But um, that's that's a question I was going to ask. Like, uh, Elle, I thought you might have you may have something to say about this. That Hi. there are more like um, <laughs> subtle, uh, <laughs> like the more subtle ways that this stuff plays out uh, in publishing. I mean, the the numbers, the money that was an important thing for everybody to look at. But I'm wondering what other ways it plays out, like for authors so, and fans and everything. To tie the money, because again, part of the conversation is money, but also part of the conversation, like they'll blame it. They'll say it's marketing and money is also just a lie. Um, but we'll tie that together with the fact that you get these really big advances for these people because that the way that publishing likes to tell itself um, to spend this money is that this story is universal. More people are going to buy this book. So we stand a better chance of making this money back. Well, mm -hmm. that then tells you what their idea of what a universal story is. Right. Right. Yep. Universal story is the one the white dude tells. Doesn't matter if he's telling it about black people or if he's telling it about somebody who's not a white dude. Him telling it makes it universal. Right. Whereas somebody else coming in and telling the same story, not so much. Although our version would be more authentic. It just is. Correct. Somebody from Italy making Italian food is going to be more authentic <laughs> to somebody right. at Olive Garden. I'm just saying. You're just right, um, though. <laughs> so then you have that aspect of it, but then you get into this whole idea. And, and I think where a lot of people get hung up and they start get defensive aside from the whole, you're calling me racist thing is they're like, well, it's just, some things are tradition. This is just how publishing is done. Ugh. And I'm like, yes, but you have to realize that these traditions were put in place back in the day for a reason. Y'all have forgotten right. why the traditions were put in place and the purpose right. they were to serve. It was to keep other people out. Right. That was the point of the yeah. quote unquote tradition. Now it's so far apart. Y'all have the luxury, the privilege, as you said, to forget about why this happens. Meanwhile, we've never forgot. Right. We know why y'all kicked us out of the playground. Right. Mm -hmm. We don't. Y'all have gotten comfortable enough in being in the playground and playing with all the toys without having to share. That somebody say asking for you to share when they should be saying, "Give me my shit back." Right. Just be happy they're asking for you to share. Right. But that in and of itself is another conversation. Me asking yeah. you to share something you stole from me. But mm, right. um, that whole idea that this is tradition is another ingrained problem. It's tradition as in it's been around for a long time, but it was put there specifically to keep certain people out. <laughs> Just because it's say, old doesn't mean it's good. Sorry, not sorry. Exactly. Right. Most of the old stuff around here is, I mean, the country's the oldest thing running and it's not right. that great. Like you, the whole, why do you include race in it? I'm like, well, first of all, ask your clan ancestors why they invented race. Okay. Correct. Because they did. <laughs> right. Then ask right. your clan ancestors why they put it in the founding documents for the country. So right. every time we have to change a law, race has to be part of it. We didn't yep. plan that. Yep. We had nothing to do with that. Y'all right. did that. Your people did that. You want to be mad. We're perfectly fine with burning it down and starting over, but you don't want to lose what little power you got, whether or not you realize that's why you hold no, because right. it'll, it tricks you into thinking that you're going to lose something. Anyway, right. back to the actual point. <laughs> I have seen, I have been one of the people who have been told, um, this is a great book, but we have our black girl book for the year. Uh, allowed one. Not we have our Alice wow. in Wonderland retelling because normally, normally, editors will read a book and they'll be like, "Oh, I already have an Alice in Wonderland retelling. I don't want another one." Although mm -hmm. it probably would come out a year after the fact, but whatever, whatever. Right. We can't even get to where it's oh, it's the same type of story. Oh, it's too close in the genre. No, we can't have. It could be the hit you give versus the Stone Obelisk. Can only have one. Two completely right. separate genres 
likely mm-hmm. going to draw two completely separate audiences. There might be right. some crossover, right. but you could only have one. That is the thing that is told. And then thinking about The Hate You Give, which I love this book to death and I love Angie. She's a really good friend. Um, but people think that buying and reading that book is all they need to do. <laughs> Uh, to, to help oh this. My God. Like, it's no, so frustrating when people really think that is. when they're like, "Oh, I, no, I, I bought a, I bought a book about a, a black person." That's the, am, I, am I good now? Am I? It's, right. it's the equivalent of saying, "I have a black friend." It uh, really that's is. what it is. It really is. It's, it's the and I bought the book about police brutality. That's even what, like, no, settle down. Right. No, right, no. <laughs> no. You but, talk um, to somebody black real quick. Talk to somebody. Sit down and talk to somebody who's had the experience. That's all you got to do. And that book. <laughs> In the auction, there was a black editor. It recently came out. He recently talked about it. There's a black editor who wanted to buy the book. But he ended up, and Angie recently talked about how she was excited, but then he just pulled out of the auction and they had no idea why. Wow. Um, cool. He had taken the book. It had gone to acquisitions. And then one of the executives, a white executive, said, we're not paying that much money for this book because black kids don't read. That is what he told oh. this person. Boy. And they missed this. The hate you, the hate you, the hate yeah. you give. Yeah, I'd Could say it imagine? ended up doing pretty I, well. I'm surprised. I if the, if the rest of the board didn't fire whoever that was on the yeah. spot. But right. anyway, that's the type of thing that happens, and you get this idea what what um what you were talking about earlier, Gerald, with um the whole notion that quality thing, the quality thing, right? Um, yeah. It's 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 where it's not that it's they think it they th- they call it quality, but what it is is that they haven't had to empathize with a character that doesn't look like them. Right. Yeah, they haven't had to do yeah. that, mm-hmm. so they can't make that connection. So automatically to them, the book is bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Meanwhile, because they didn't connect to the protagonist because exactly. it wasn't similar enough to them. It wasn't similar enough to them. Like hmm. black folk, which we is have which had, is a thing we've had to do. Forever, right, right? Forever, right. right. Every, we have always had to make that extra little jump every yep. time to connect with the protagonists in TV right. shows, in movies, in plays, in right. novels, in right. every single you know art form out there. But, right. but you know, and this goes back to what El was saying earlier that that the white white character is the default character, right. That, that's mm-hmm. that's that's where that's what we're fighting against, right? Because right. you know that's been seen as the universal story. Because you know, it, 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 listen, my mother was uh, uh, before she retired was an executive at General Electric, and one of the things that black folk in corporate America will tell you is that people work their way up often because uh, someone above them decides to mentor them. Right. 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 And help them navigate uh, the promotional ladder. Right. But what social scientists found out is that when people are up on the top of the ladder looking down for someone that they can mentor, who are they looking for? They're looking for the younger them. Right. Hmm. Right. Yep. So so if everyone up there is a white dude. Right. Who are they looking for? Right, the white dudes. Well, well, right. they don't want to. They don't want to. They don't want to mentor L or me because right. we don't look like them. They want right. They want to. They want to mentor Chad and Kyle, you know. Right. And again, mm-hmm. Chad and Kyle get another leg up because not only right. do they get in the door easier, but once they're in the door, someone higher up sees themselves in Kyle and Chad, and right. then decides to take an interest in Kyle and Chad, and then greases the skids and the wheels for Kyle and Chad. To get them up the ladder further, right? Right. So, right. so, so we have the same we have the same problem in publishing, because the people who have been the gatekeepers and who have been writing the checks and who have been making the decisions all this time have been in a position to say, well, you know what 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 L just just revealed to us about the hate you give. Oh well, uh, I'm not going to put money behind that black story. Because that black story is not my story, <clears throat> but but right. and then I'm going to say this real quick. Here, but here's the pernicious part of it, right? Because the audience now has gotten tired of the same old story with the same old white protagonist. I mean, when you look at uh-huh. when you look at the stories that have been told, right? 
uh, the white hero has been told from every single angle it can be told from from the from the the lawful good shining white dude all the way down to the to the the grimy hateful dude that they've turned into an anti-hero and still made him the the quote-unquote good guy of the story i mean they told that story from every possible angle they could and 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 uh, the audience is, is looking for something different right so what mm-hmm. do they do? Do they go out and say, okay, we need some different stories? Do they go out and say, okay, let's find some people of color to write these stories? No. What they do is they is they say, uh, let, let's tell Kyle and Chad to write these stories, but write them about uh, people of color. Mm-hmm. Right? right. Yeah. Instead, of going, instead of going to get L. 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 McKinney to do it, Instead of going to get uh, Milton Davis or uh, N.K. Jemison or, or whoever you want to use as an example, uh, we we still banking on Kyle and Chad. So let's have right. them write the story with the black protagonists, the black male protagonists and the black female protagonists and the uh, Asian female protagonists and uh, whatever uh, story that you're looking for. They're still asking Kyle and Chad to do that instead of going to the to place they should be going is to those people who know those stories and can tell those stories and are in a position to tell those stories well. I mean, imagine right. if they had given Black Panther to J.J. Abrams. <laughs> right. I couldn't imagine. That right? would be... I'm, it's I'm it's mean, not hard hey, to imagine, unfortunately. Hey, listen, listen, 10 years ago, that's what they would have done. That's, that's what I was exact, saying before social exactly media. What they they would have given done. it to him. Exactly. That's, that's, yeah, that's, true. that's exactly what they would have done. But imagine what that story would have been now that we know how much went into the behind the scenes of creating that, right. that story. Right. right? Uh, uh, right. From the costume designers down to the casting, down to the music, uh, uh, you know, down to the sets. Everything that went into creating that story, <clears throat> that was drip, that was that drenched in, uh, uh, you know, our culture, right? Right, Afrofuturism that, and and Afrocentric. It was it was yeah. African. It was, it was a lot of things, and it was, it was, uh, it was gorgeous. Uh, put tears and in my JJ, eyes. But look, JJ Abrams just could. That's my point. JJ Abrams right. couldn't have done that. He just couldn't. Fuck but no. That's what, but that's what we keep doing. That's that's what keeps happening in publishing. What, what right. keeps happening in publishing is they keep trying to get Chad and Kyle to tell those stories and give them an $800,000 advance to yeah. tell those stories. Uh, b- because somehow, which it boggles my mind, again, what Elle said earlier, somehow they still think that's a universal story. Right. They because, don't have to because, because Kyle else. and Chad, because Kyle and Chad are writing it. Yep. Right? And see, I, yep. I wanna I wanna say, um, for people who would be like who would because people would listening would be like, Oh, so now you're saying that JJ Abrams is a bad director. Okay. No beloved, not at all. <laughs> no. Right. JJ right. Abrams can direct his ass off. Yes, he can. Right. He could not have done Black Panther as well as Ryan Coogler did. Nope, these exactly. are two things that can exist at the same time. It comes to the same thing when it comes to these black stories. Right. I'm fairly certain that somebody, like the people who they find to write the stories, most of them, because I, like you said, mediocrity is king in these here streets. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of really good white authors. There are a lot of right. great white authors. There right. just mm-hmm. are. My favorites starting out were white because I didn't know nothing else. Because what right. nothing else out there? You know right. what I'm saying? Like I didn't. We were reading all these books in high school. I didn't know who Octavia Butler was until I went to college. So right. that's the type of things that happen when you have again the obsession with dead white people. But right. yes. um, <laughs> so then you have this this whole thing where it's like no, they are good at writing the stories that they write. But if it's a story about a person of color, I promise you an author of color is going to do better. Just- yeah, it's like guaranteed. And there's no there's no shortage. Either. Like, so that's something that I, I want to like I want to put out there, especially to my white friends, 
is that because there's there's this pushback, and I know Gerald, I know this is one that pisses you off, especially this pushback that people get when they're like, "Well, I just can't find any. I can't find black authors in like oh we focus God. on we focus on science fiction and fantasy a lot." And there's people like, "But there's not like there's not much out there," and oh that is absolutely God. not true. So what I wanted to say to my white friends about that is, <laughs> yes, they are out there, absolutely out there. Yes. We're talking to yes. a, a couple of great uh, fantasy authors right now, right. Um, and it, Gerald's even put together a great like a list of it's kind of like a starter pack uh, for anybody who's looking for black science fiction, fantasy horror authors. It is not a short list and it's full of great, great authors. And that's just a starting point. Like people cannot use, well, I don't know of any as an excuse. Like there's, right, there is right. so much out there that you can't, I mean, if, if that's all you read for the next 10 years, you might get a, a decent start on the whole list. Right, so right, so don't right, use right. that as an excuse. Go find them. Uh, we'll put some links in the show notes like we always do. And by the way, side note, um, links to Gerald's work and Elle's work are going to be in the show notes. I'm just reminding everybody, check the show notes yep. and uh, click those links, buy those books. Click those um, links. I just, yes. it's this thing with, it's going back to a tradition, right? Where the demographic where the guy, he was like, black kids don't read. And this is where I was talking about earlier, where I was like, it's kind of the money, but also the money is a lie where they're like, it's just not marketable or we want to follow the dollars. Right Right. now, and for a while now, black women and girls have been the largest reading demographic in the country. So if publishing heads were truthfully following (laughs) the market, who would most of these books be about? Right. Black women. Uh Uh-huh. I'm just saying it would be black women and girls in these right. books, in these if if you were actually following the market. That's how I know that the market is driven by these racist quote unquote traditions and not by right. actual money. Cause you're putting the money towards what you want the market to be, not what the market actually is. Right. Exactly. Right. And when you right. start doing that, that proves it's not about the market, it's about your racism and your racist traditions. Right. Because it it should it should be so backwards that it's mostly black women and girls on these books than any right. other demographic. If you were actually doing what you claim you're trying right. to do when you say, no, the market's not there. Right. I think that market's not there thing. It just, that just reeks of bullshit to me. There's no way that's true, but it, it is responsible. I think for a lot of, it's the lack of, lack of marketing, lack of money, lack of backup and support from publishers. That's why I know Gerald, I've seen you mentioned before that, uh, that a lot of, uh, a lot of authors choose to go the self-publishing route be- largely because they, they know they're not going to get the, the same support as their white counterparts and they're not going to get enough support at traditional publishing houses. Um, even if they fight their asses off for it, it's still going to be harder to come by. So it's like, why am I going to, why go that route? I mean, is that, is that still how you see it? Uh, well, there are a couple of things, but, but yeah, that's definitely one of them. Be, uh, but, but you know, that's just, that's not even just uh, black authors or, or authors that are people of color uh, publishing houses across the board for, for, for everyone except for a select few uh, books, they just aren't spending money on marketing anymore. You know, huh. the, the, the advances are smaller. They aren't spending very much money on marketing. And, I, and for, from my perspective, my question then becomes, well, if you, if you aren't really going to spend any money marketing my book, then, which is really the only, arguably the only value that, that <clears throat> at least I see in being published by one of the big houses. If you're not going to do that, <clears throat> then why in the world would I put myself through that process of where the other stuff comes up, which is, uh, am I going to argue about uh, putting a black character on the cover? Uh, are you going to give me an editor who isn't going to question uh, whether or not this black character would do that when <laughs> they would be perfectly fine with a white character doing that in the story uh, but then you've got to fight tooth the nail for all of these little things, right? Uh, for your story to be the story that you want it to be, and because of all of those hurdles and obstacles, I mean, I know a lot of folks who are self and indie published. They just aren't interested in that fight, right? And, and yeah. especially when when the payoff from the on the other end is going to where, where I mean, I know white authors who are on the bestsellers list who had books out by. Um, some of the major publishing houses who who questioned where the marketing was and and they were told you need to get on twitter Mm. Mm. 
So right. so if I've got if I've got to get on Twitter anyway, then why right. am I <laughs> why why am I accepting uh ninety five cents or a dollar royalty per book, and you take the rest when you're not really investing in 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 getting me out there? And 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 let me be clear. And I, I wish I could find the article. Um, I ran across about three years ago, I think, with some real insightful stuff about how the publishing industry has changed because 20 years ago, publishing houses would take an unknown author and really mentor them and build their brand, right? You didn't have to come through the door as this amazing out-of-the-box blow everything out of the water, author <clears throat> selling two million copies, right? They used to take folk and, and really kind of invest in them and build them up over the course of a, a, a few books to get them to that point. They used to make mm. those kinds of investments. Obviously, they weren't making those kinds of investments in us. They were making them right. in Chad and Kyle, right? right. But they, <laughs> Sorry they to hate Chad to and Kyle. Yeah, but that but that's what they that's what they used to do. They don't do that anymore. They they throw out these books and either your book catches fire or it doesn't and then they move on to the next. And so a lot of the folk who are doing self and indie pub are people who are making a calculation. I think sometimes people make an assumption that those are folks who quote unquote they do it because they can't get published or they do it because they aren't good writers. No, they're making some very astute calculations about, about profit sharing, about uh, access to marketing, about uh, the editorial process, about everything from whether or not they can put a black character on their cover without having a knockdown drag out fight about it and what the story is going to ultimately be. Uh, if, if, instead of someone kind of trying to heap all these stereotypes on them. So they're making all right. of these very serious, calculated decisions. And a lot of them have just decided, well, they're not going to spend $50,000 marketing my book. Why am I going to give them the lion's share of the profits of what I've sell? If I've got to carry all of that on my shoulders anyway, then I might as well do it. And that way I can make all of those decisions myself. I can put what I can create the, the image that I want on the cover, I can tell the story I want to tell without having to fight somebody over it. And there, so there are a number of kind of decisions that folk go through in mm -hmm. order to do that. Uh, now, that's not to say yeah. that there aren't uh, substandard and bad books out there. Obviously, there are. But sure. because, right. of, because of what's happened in technology in the last 10 years, but most importantly, in the last five um you can find some incredibly amazing books out there that have the same kind of, um, uh, well, let me put it this way. They don't, you can pick that book up off of a shelf and it doesn't look any different than uh, a book that's produced by one of the major publishing houses. Right. Like, that's yeah, that's true. I know there's... That's what, <clears throat> that's what technology has allowed us to do. And it's allowed a lot of diverse voices to get out there. And right. consequently, consequently, while there is this uh, ongoing narrative in, in big publishing that science fiction and fantasy as a genre is losing sales, the truth of the matter is, is that all those sales are happening over in the indie self space and right. and huh. and that and they're blowing up right there's actually right. more oh, yeah. books being sold than there were 10 years ago they're just being they're just not being sold by uh Macmillan or Tor or you know wh whoever Del Rey whoever you want to put out there they're being right. sold in at 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 at, at, at uh, booths and cons they're being sold yeah. on uh, on Amazon and on Barnes and Noble and on Bookshop. They're being sold in all of these other kind of individual places, and they're being right. and 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 it's because people are looking for those interesting stories that are being told, and because you and because you have the technology now to put it out there in a package that looks as good as the package that a a, a major house puts out, then that's incentivizing people to explore and experiment uh, with what's out there. Yeah, right. yeah, that's cool. It's definitely been changing around a bit.
Right. It, it's um it's something that um I don't know. It, it kind of goes full circle with 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 um, and it's a double edged sword. The internet itself and, and social media and and being able to 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 actually have your voice out there because, like well, like both of you guys have said before, you know, racism really kind of stabs us and tries to keep us, you know, tries to push back on us whenever we're um, making advancements and, and telling good stories and having a, a good time in general. Um, but I, I have a question uh, that I want to pose to you, you both. And, and I want to, I want to pose it to L first. If you had to write an ending to this current situation, what would it be? Uh, and by, define and this by cur- situation, please. <laughs> by, and by current situation, I mean COVID and the orange menace and, and all of it. You mean besides the meteor? Besides the meteor. <laughs> if you had to go get... Go straight you had for to the get, meteor. If you had I mean, to get, I'm looking... I, okay, so besides the meteor, <laughs> besides the rapture, okay. uh, you know, I... I don't even know if I could imagine what it would be like to just tomorrow. Shit just wasn't sideways. Um, mm. I would say that just to start, because there are so many, it's one of those things where once you uncover one problem, you mm-hmm. see that there were other problems happening, but you just didn't notice because of this problem over here, it's like, oh, I have like a cracked tooth, but I don't notice I have a cracked tooth because this impacted wisdom tooth is stealing all the thunder right now. Right. So yeah. once the wisdom tooth is dealt with, then you start feeling the pain from the cracked tooth. So I feel that whatever solution happens and it solves, you know, the very real pain of the wisdom tooth for the world right now, we're going to start dealing with some cracks. So I I couldn't (laughs) even begin to view what it would look like. Like for me, um, if I'm just going to blue sky it, anything could happen. The next 44 presidents are black people. I'm sorry. (laughs) They they black or they native. That's it. They black or they native. Or they both. You can be black and native. It's a thing. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But those are the folks who are running the country. And then the folks who are running, you know, the states and the cities, same thing. And mm-hmm. um, America deals with its history, with slavery and racism. Like Germany still has problems, but right. the rise of the Nazi party is not going to be it just because of how they've dealt with the right. Germany while they were on some fuck shit. Came back Definitely. and were like, never again, my nigga. Like, right. Never again. No, we right. will. We will go out. This this is a uh, <laughs> bomb that is set to my heart, and if my heart stops beating, we're done. And your right. heart is if these Nazis show up again, we're just we're just done as a country. So they they have set rules and regulations in motion. Like it is illegal. First Amendment rights be. Damn, it is illegal right. for you to openly be a Nazi <laughs> in that country. You better wave yes. right, because if you wave right. the wrong way, you're getting arrested. Exactly. Oh, like, yeah. if, so you, I, if, if you do a high salute, they will arrest you. They will, they will. They will arrest you. They put will. handcuffs on you and take you away. It's yeah, not it's, even it, a game. It's, it's not a game. It's not so a game. I think nope. that America, like we're still having arguments about whether or not the Civil War was because of slavery or oh, not right. Right. The heritage or right. whatever. Right. Y'all can't right. even get that shit together. They can't so, read. Right. It's and it's like, y'all papers. mad now <laughs> because this flag is going up. Like, the South, the Confederacy were traitors to the nation. Right. Yes. Where else How in do the people keep overlooking of ever, that? In the history of, name me another country. Even Queen Colonizer England, name me another country where you were allowed to still fly the flag of the traitors. Right after yeah, a civil good. war, you not take yeah, they were the enemies. Lose. Like they were the enemies, and we all fought. And then right. you know we they seceded because we got our shit together, kind of, and we gave them their country back. Now they can fly their actual country flag. That's not the same as it's this. Not. These people did not exist until they were in opposition 
to the right. actual country. So Correct. nowhere else. Mm-hmm. So right. uh, reparations and mm-hmm. black and right. native presidents and leaders, I think for America, as far as the rest of the world is, I'm not as well versed. So I'll right. let y'all handle your own backyard. Right. Yeah. I, I do Gerald, know that if you, if you were trying to write something that would, uh, that would wrap up all the current threads we got going on right now, then you have, you have your work cut out for you. But yeah, Gerald, I will say a lot think? of people will die. I'm just going to put it. There will be many, many a nightmare slaying. It was mm. it was utopian for a second there, and then and then you got real dark. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay with. I get what you said. I get it. There are people who are like, I, right. I, if if we gonna have equality, then I'd rather die. Well, then, bitch, here's the gun. Or the <laughs> on your you you get to choose. But there's right. a door. Here's a pill. Red pill or blue pill? We don't care. You made that choice. You the one that don't want to live with everybody being free. Right, right, right. right. You can change your mind up until, you know, you're done, whatever. You sure right. you want to go? Okay, then let me help you. I'm be a good neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me be a good neighbor here. L is not to get Superman's powers ever. You, you, cannot, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot allow her to have Superman powers. I'm serving my fellow man. Be- there will if be you blood say that everywhere. you would rather die than yeah. see another black person in the White House, well, I'm going to chuck your ass into the sun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Gerald, I'm afraid to even ask this. No, fuck it. How would you, how would you wrap this up? How would you write the ending? How would you well, write the ending? Okay, so so I I'm I'm a fantasy a sci-fi and fantasy writer, right? So right. So it would it would be a fantasy story where this is all in the prelude, right? Right. The the cataclysmic right. uh, prelude that ends with you know the world having been destroyed and right. then they're having to figure out a way <clears throat> to rise out of the ashes, and then you go into chapter one which is a couple of hundred years later and then the story right. kicks off from there right that right. that's how that's how I do it as a fantasy writer but I feel I feel really sorry for uh, people who are writing in the genres where reality has just ruined right all of their story making capacity like right like like reality is just so messed up right now that there are just stories where People would look at that story and be like, "Eh, eh." Right? How do you even write a dystopia right now? Right, oh, oh. right, exactly. You know, like, the, right. like oh, some of that be has been ruined. Right, but uh, you couldn't write. You couldn't sell this story. You couldn't sell the story that we're. Nobody would believe it. I, you couldn't oh, sell the story if, that we. If were, I, I'm. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. <laughs> we can talk uh, we can talk about it after we can talk about it yeah okay. after we'll, this we'll talk, we can talk about it offline we can oh, talk about, right it. right oh jeez we'll, 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 we'll go off <laughs> i'm, I'm looking that. forward to that we might as well yes. we might as well wrap up actually because i want to know what she's talking about <laughs> right right, so right. Let's, go, let's go ahead and get off my Ooh, i like how Good jared yeah. was nicer than me he was like yeah the meteor happened but a couple years 100 years later <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna pick up now we got over it it's all right <laughs> <laughs> we're looking at the we're looking at the self censors like oh we shut it down shut it down shut it down yes yeah, shut no shut it down uh, no, no. Right. <laughs> we don't have censors yes nah. we will talk about it and people at home who are listening to us right now can't hear it and I'm sorry that you can't hear it and I'm gonna keep it to my grave might put it in my you memoirs know. if I get her permission but um <laughs> this is my secret nugget this is one of my gifts. For, for providing some voices. <laughs> this is one of the things that I get to have. Y'all can have it. And I'm also probably going to have Pattinson's Batman and, and me and Gerald will talk about that too. Don't y'all <laughs> even know. We, hey, that's a separate conversation, y'all. We don't have time for this. We don't have time for this fight right now. Thank you. I, appre- I appreciate... I, he's booing me right now, but I appreciate you, Gerald Coleman. And I re- and I appreciate L McKinney for joining uh, Jesse and I and and having some conversations. This is extremely fun. I I had a blast, and you guys yes, filled me you. up with a lot of knowledge. Um, I I really can't I really can't wait to 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 hear more about about the things that you guys write. Um, if if you haven't 
read. Listen, everything's going to be in the show notes. Click on the links, buy these books, and yes. sit down and enjoy yourself. Uh, we're in a pandemic right now. We got a bunch of shit going on, and this is uh, one of the best forms of escapism that you're going to be able to get your hands on. And I'm very happy and privileged to provide you know, these two fantastic voices for you to listen to. If you're new to it, you're welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jesse, really do you have to anything go. to say? Yes, definitely. Uh, just, I also want to thank um, LL McKinney and Gerald L. Coleman for coming on with us and talking about this, uh, this subject today. And uh, everybody, no kidding, go buy their books. Uh, right. the, the Nightmare Verse books, starting with A Blade So Black by LL McKinney. That is such a great Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland retelling with um, the, a, a by a black girl as a heroine. It's just, it's so much fun to read. My wife is a gigantic fan of them. Uh, and there's another one coming out before too long, too. The trilogy is going to be concluding. Uh, also, can't wait to see what you're doing with uh, with Nubia for DC. I am super excited about yeah. that one. I'm going to need yes. a signed copy of that. I'm going to definitely need a signed <laughs> yes. copy. Oh, for sure. I, I'm and, going to frame it and put it on my wall and say, look what I have, everybody. And y'all check out uh, Gerald's works. The, the The first book of the Three Gifts series is called When Night Falls. Look that up, Gerald L. Coleman, When Night Falls, and get started on that series. And if you're Perfect. a fan of poetry, really got to check out Gerald's oh, yes. stuff. The, the collection's yes. out now, Nappy Metaphysic. Love the title, by the way. Yes. Um, check that out. It's like if you if you're into poetry, even if you're not, you'll get into poetry. So check it you out. Will. But, Absolutely. Um, so, uh, L, first, where should people look for you online? What do you want them to know about where to look you up? So you can go to uh, my website, which is llmckinney.com, just like it is on the uh, the covers of the books. And in I think in this current iteration of my website, in the upper right-hand corner, there are the links to uh, all of my stuff. If not, just scroll to the bottom of the page and you'll have the links to all of my stuff. I'm mostly on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where I spend the predominant amount of my time just because everything else requires you to post pictures in order to right. post things. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't do pictures. Okay. Um, right. So that's where I am. And it's L on words and L is spelled out like the magazine E L L E on words. Yes. She's a great follow. One of the best on Twitter. So get on that. Um, Gerald, where do you want people to find you? Where can they look for you online? Uh, <clears throat> the easiest way to find me is, is, is just to go to, Gerald L. Coleman.com. And all, right. uh, all my stuff is there. Yeah. Excellent. And you can also, uh, we, when you go to uh, the blog on my site, which is called Just Add Coffee, uh, <laughs> you'll find the uh, one of the posts that has that um, beginner's guide to science fiction and fantasy. And there's about 25, 26 books on that list. Uh, LL's book is on there. There's a bunch of other stuff on there uh, for people who claim to not know where they can find uh, black <laughs> authors writing science fiction and fantasy. The, the, there's some the 25 or so books for you to start your your. It's a beginner's guide. It's not an exhaustive guide, but you know I got tired of seeing. Not that they aren't great authors, they are, but mm-hmm. I got tired of seeing the same three or four people listed when folks were making lists of yep. the the black science fiction and fantasy you should be reading. And our bench is so much deeper than those two or three names. They're great hey. names. Uh, nothing against them. I love them. But our bench is very deep. And there are a lot of folks out there who you could be reading, who you should be reading, who you'd enjoy reading. And so I decided to put that list together. Uh, just And it's a beginner's guide. It's not an exhaustive guide, but it's a good place for you to start if you're looking for black writers who are writing science fiction and fantasy. Yes, we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes too. It really is a great resource. Well, yes. L.L. McKinney, Gerald Coleman, thank you both very, very much. We're going to wrap it up now, let you get back to your lives. We really appreciate you taking the time, bringing your perspective to Glitchy Pancakes. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I'm looking for those pancakes in the mail. All right. Got you. We got you. I'm not. Uh, y'all have a good <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> All right. Rob? That was yes, fun, sir. Huh? Oh, my God. That was – that's amazing. That is yeah, fantastic. Yeah, love having them on. We got um, no. We have to. We have to. There's so much other stuff we can talk to him about too. Like we're gonna have okay. to do follow up episodes about all kinds of different topics. Oh yeah, that was excellent. Um, well, I'm, let's go ahead and uh, tell everybody where to find us and, and all that stuff. Um, you want to? Uh, 
run it down? You can go ahead. You can go ahead. Okay. Well, for the podcast, you can uh, find us glitchypancakes.com. You can uh, stream the episodes right from there or subscribe to us on Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, a bunch of other ones. We're still waiting on you, Apple. Um, Come on, Apple. On response. Yeah. Uh, find us on Twitter and Facebook at Glitchy Pancakes. If you have questions, suggestions, comments, email cakespod at gmail and we will read them. Uh, me personally, you can find me on Twitter at jesse underscore a underscore Adams. And Rob? And if you want to follow me on Twitter, okay, that's cool. I am at EI Blackout. That is I A I B L A C K O U T. And I will say hello to you and send a thumbs up. And I will also read your emails at cakespod.com. That's C A K E S P O D. At, gmail. at gmail.com. I did say dot com yep. again. See, I'm freaking excited. I'm so excited that I'm doing I this. Know, oh I know. my god. Yes. All right. Well, hey, we got some uh, we got some uh, some audio stuff to do. Let's go get on that and uh, let everybody get back to their lives. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We appreciate, we appreciate all the support it. that you've given us so far. Thank you for listening, and uh, hope you had a good time. Yeah, we did, uh, and I hope you had a good time too. Um, take it easy, guys. Bye, everybody.